Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very much hoping that, uh, that I'm now live with you all. Um, and um, welcome. I'd just like to mention before we go anywhere um, that um, this event is being recorded on Facebook Live. Um, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all to our new online fortnightly review um, series, Liverpool Responds where some of our most eminent researchers will be taking you through the work that they're doing to analyze and address the global pandemic. We have a great inaugural event lined up for you this morning, focusing in particular on elements of our health research. And over the course of the coming weeks, we'll be offering you insight into other areas of our COVID-19 related research activity, from the impact of the lockdown on the environment to the challenges facing the hospitality industry, the support needed to support uh, to help small and medium-sized businesses and the return of football. Indeed, so many areas of the university's research have been converted quickly to understanding and acting on the challenges presented by the current pandemic, um, that it is a real source of pride for all of us in the institution. Um, this isn't the only way in which the university has been supporting the national effort and I do want to take this opportunity to say again just how proud I am of the entire university community for the incredible ways in which we've come together uh, to do all that we can at this time. The collective effort across both research and operational activities has been breathtaking. Uh, last week many of us had the emotional experience of, of leading a special virtual graduation ceremony for our medical students 230 of those students were joined by nearly 100 of our student nurses and some of our experienced clinical academics, all of whom volunteered to help at the front line of the NHS. And in stepping forward to help the NHS at a time of immense, immense need, treating patients who would otherwise have struggled to access the same level of care. And of course, in facing um, the real threat of contracting an infection themselves as a result, our students, now our graduates, have really made a difference to patients and their families right across the city region. Um, colleagues and PhD students in the schools of engineering and architecture have been hard at work producing more than 15,000 3D protective visors for use by healthcare staff in the NHS, and still more PPE has been made available through the generous donations of friends and alumni in China. You know, as you can imagine, I could go on, um, but I won't because we've got an exciting event for you today. And I'm really thrilled to be joined today by three world leading healthcare researchers. Professor Louise Kenny is our Executive Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences. And her specific clinical and research expertise is in hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Louise's current research involves the screening of blood samples from over 16,000 pregnant women at the Liverpool Women's Hospital with a view to identifying the prevalence of COVID-19 in this group over the course of the pandemic and therefore determining whether they are at decreased risk of contracting the virus or at decreased risk of adverse outcomes or both. And in addition to this important work, Louise is directing the Stop COVID one Liverpool response, and she's going to be saying a bit more on this at the moment. Um, I'm pleased also to introduce Professors Callum Semple and Tom Solomon, both of whom will be very familiar to you from their current regular appearances on the um, BBC Breakfast Sofa and a range of other news outlets. Um, Callum is a professor in child health and outbreak medicine and a consultant respiratory pa paediatrician at Alder Hay Children's Hospital. He's an advisor to SAGE and has been responsible for important research indicating that age, male sex, obesity and underlying illness have emerged as risk factors for severe and fatal cases of COVID-19. Tom is director of the National Institute for Health Research Health Protection Unit, Research Unit in Emerging and Zoonotic Infections. 
here at the university, having been heavily involved in the UK research response to both Zika and Ebola, he now has oversight of and gives support to the whole portfolio on COVID-19 research projects. So as you can tell, we have much to talk about this morning, and I'd like to start by asking Louise to say a few words. Thanks, Janet, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, so as Janet mentioned, um, I'm going to briefly discuss uh, the uh, stop, Liverpool Stop COVID uh, command and control um, organisation change that we've made in response to what we have uh, found to be an unprecedented uh, public health challenge. And I think it's fair to say, as Janet mentioned, that this unprecedented challenge has been met with um, uh, an unprecedented response. So very early on in uh, the onset of this pandemic in late February, early March, we discussed pausing uh, all non-COVID based research on our campus to pivot and focus entirely on addressing the pandemic. Um, as Callum and Tom will already will describe shortly, we were already doing uh, a lot of COVID based research before we paused non-COVID research, but pausing and actually pivoting allowed us to focus all of our resource uh, on addressing this pandemic. Uh, in a matter of a few days, we realigned across the region uh, in a command and control structure, which is led by the faculty um, to oversee all COVID related research activity throughout the footprint of our, of our region. So not just on our campus, but in fact, throughout the footprint of our clinical research network across the Northwest. Um, the first thing that we did was distribute over a million pounds worth of repurposed and philanthropic funding to pump prime a range of projects. And we'll be discussing some of those projects shortly. Um, these projects led to uh, the submission of dozens of UKRI uh, rapid response grant applications, many of which have been funded and the work is now in full flight. And in fact, we were party to some data that we saw last week that shows that across the country, University of Liverpool is third uh, nationally in terms of our success rate in the UKRI um, COVID rapid response call, which is a, a really outstanding uh, metric. Uh, in addition, uh, Liverpool as a high incidence, a high disease incidence area has continued to support um, and recruit to an array of nationally very important studies and trials. And one of those trials has actually led to the data that you may have seen discussed uh, at length in the last 24 hours um, um, in media outlets on the use of steroids uh, for the treatment of COVID-19. And I think Callum and Tom will be happy to discuss uh, the significance of, of those trials in more detail shortly. But our success in recruiting to those trials has been noted at the highest level and the way Liverpool is self-organised is now being held up by colleagues elsewhere as a national example of good practice. And I think it would be uh, remiss of me not to stop at this point and thank all the staff and volunteers uh, who continue to support this work across our region, many of which are, are our own university colleagues, but also partners throughout the NHS and elsewhere. Obviously, we're now in a different phase of this pandemic and we're looking to the next few months and the restart of non-COVID related research and work. And in parallel with the restart of the NHS, um, we're now engaging with all colleagues to ensure that we do this in a, a safe and coordinated manner. Um, we are acutely aware um, that colleagues uh, from across the faculty uh, whose research programmes have been paused are very anxious to now uh, get to get back to their labs and back to their work and to do so in a way that actually will continue to benefit um, our continuing response to COVID because it's um, we've been aware for some time that the post-COVID world will actually still include COVID. The virus will continue to circulate and our work will therefore have to adapt and continue. And the way in which we've evolved over the last few months is incredibly reassuring that we'll be able to do that. Um, it's also abundantly clear um, that our university, which has a very noble tradition um, of excellence in both infectious diseases research and clinical pharmacology, vaccine development, uh, will play a key part in the economic recovery of our city. There's a huge amount of talk at the moment about um, the restart of our economy. Um, and I think there are no silver linings to this pandemic, especially in our city, which has suffered disproportionately. Um, we are acutely aware of the very human stories behind each statistic. But if there is something positive to look to from the recovery, it's that the work of universities has never been more important. And I think probably never been more valued, certainly in the recent past. Our research both into COVID and our non-COVID research is, is hugely important locally, regionally and nationally. Um, and I think it will play a key part in the economic recovery of our city, 
the health and life sciences sector is now firmly in the sights of um, all of our investment plans uh, to take Liverpool forward. I think it's also abundantly clear that educating the next generation of doctors and healthcare workers and research scientists has also never been more important. And we can um, take some comfort from the fact that we have done more than our fair share in terms of educating uh, the next generation of those, of those key workers. So I think I'll, I'll probably pause there. Um, I think we really want to get to the main event, which is to hear from our two absolute frontline experts, Callum and, and Ton. Um, but we will be delighted to take questions about any of the things that I've just touched on, particularly around the, the, the Stop COVID uh, uh, Command and Control uh, organization which we lead. So I'm going to hand over to Callum. As the Vice Chancellor mentioned, Callum is has a personal chair in child health and outbreak medicine. Um, he is prior to COVID was best known for his uh, outstanding work on Ebola. So he's been incredibly um, experienced and well placed to address uh, this particular pandemic. He's chief investigator of the um, ISERIC clinical characterization protocol. Uh, Callum is possibly too uh, modest to mention, but that protocol and the huge amount of data that it has generated in a very short space of time underpins almost all the, our knowledge that we have of how COVID operates within uh, the UK. You'll have seen lots of information around the fact that it seems to be quite a discriminatory condition affecting some uh, portions of our population in a more adverse way, particularly the elderly, uh, particularly men and particularly uh, patients from uh, black and other ethnic minority backgrounds. And all of that data has been generated from the study that Callum uh, leads. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Callum. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That's a, a great introduction. And thank you to everyone who's dialed in for taking such interest in what we're doing. I've been asked to talk a little bit about the research and perhaps a little bit more about SAGE, which is this mysterious committee that you've probably heard about uh, in the media. The research we're doing, uh, working out of Liverpool, Edinburgh and London, is to understand this disease called COVID. And the process is to understand the who, the what and the why. So the who are the ages of the people, the sex, their ethnicity and their underlying diseases. And we've discovered that the disease in the West is very different to the disease that was described initially in China. And that reflects different lifestyle, different habits, different eating, um, and different genetic backgrounds. So interestingly in the West, people that have, are, are overweight or obese are much more severely affected uh, than was previously thought would be the case. And that's influenced discussions around who should be in these high risk groups and who should be shielded. So that's a sort of immediate impact that we've had doing research in Liverpool, Edinburgh and London on the outbreak. The next bit is the what. What does this disease do to people? How does it attack their lungs? How does it make their uh, blood clotting go abnormal? Also, how does it happen inside hospitals? Do we see increased rates of hospital acquired infection? And we've now got good evidence that a second outbreak occurred throughout our nursing homes and in our hospitals, and that led to an amplification of disease within the United Kingdom and may actually explain why Britain uh, had a much higher case rate than some of the other European countries where they have a different method of caring for people in the community and in the hospitals. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interest in that in the public inquiries going forward. Lastly, the why. So we do the who, the what and the why. And the why is the really exciting bit. That's, that's when we take blood samples, uh, urine samples and uh, secretions from the nose and the throat. And we try and discover what's changing in the chemistry and the immunological parts of these secretions. And that allows us to do drug discovery and work on new therapeutics. And that's the exciting bit where we, make, we, make, we hope to make future discoveries. So that's the kind of research that I do. We've very lean, pragmatic ways of going about doing this. And we learnt these techniques working in, initially actually in, in flu in 2009, and then in West Africa, we polished our techniques there. The same techniques and data forms were actually used by Chinese colleagues in Wuhan. And um, we were very impressed that they gathered 40,000 case records and analysed them within about six weeks. Actually, in the UK, we've now done 60,000 case records and it took us just under three months. But we've used exactly the same techniques. Tom's going to tell you about the recovery trial led by Peter Horby. But again, 
Peter Horby used these same lean research techniques to run two studies in China and then lift the study straight into the UK. And that's why Peter Horby was able to run the recovery study at such, such incredible pace and produce amazing results, which were described last night in the news. So that's about the research that we do. Which brings me on to SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group of Experts. I've always dreaded being described as an expert, but um, you can't dodge it at this point. Because we're running a large research study that provides dynamic data, so we don't wait six months to do the analysis and then write it up and send it off to a dusty journal. That's, that's not what Outbreak Medicine is about. Outbreak Medicine is about gathering the data, analyzing it in real time, and getting it to policymakers often before there's been an opportunity to publish it in peer-reviewed uh, papers. And that brings with it some risk. It means that some of the information we take forward will be wrong, not out of, not out of, out of fault, but wrong out of design and out of chance, because early data always has a risk of being a bit wobbly and not quite accurate. So you'll have seen the scientific advisory group of experts providing data and discussing stuff in the press where we're saying this is a signal or a message. We're not saying this is necessarily the best evidence. It's just the best evidence we've got on the day. And that's why in the press, you'll have noticed that there have been changes in policy and reversals of policy where politicians have made decisions. And then the science has come back and said, actually, you know, you didn't get that quite right. Um, you need to think about this a bit harder. And that's why you might have seen, for example, changes around an announcement of 3.2 million pound home testing kits that were going to be sent out in a matter of days. And that all went very quiet because the science came in and said, actually, these tests don't work the way we think they do. So that's what, that's what SAGE does. So SAGE is a group of experts from engineering, physics, medicine, epidemiology. And we bring in the best evidence we can. We have a very robust discussion about the evidence. We try and identify the fulcrum around which uncertainty pivots, because often you, if you put two scientists in a room, you get two very different opinions. So you try and find out what is the exact point of uncertainty. And then we give advice to ministers saying, this is what we're quite sure about. And if you do this, it will have that consequence. And we can, you can be quite sure about that. This bit, a bit wobbly, a bit gray, might not go the way you think it does but this is potentially what will go on. And then the ministers have to decide about what gets, what's happening. That brings me on to the next point. When you hear the ministers standing on the podium and saying, we're following the science, just beware of that, okay? That really means if it all goes wrong, it's the scientists' fault. And what we scientists would rather they were saying is, we're following the scientists as best we know their evidence is, but actually the ministers have to make the decision. And the ministers have to make the decision taking into account the secondary consequences of a scientific piece of advice. Or they may have to say, actually, the science isn't very good here. Nobody really knows the answer. But if they just say, we're following the science, watch out. That's sometimes a minister who's saying, if this goes wrong, it's their fault. So watch out for that. So I hope that's given you a little bit of insight into how SAGE works and what we're doing with some of the research here in Liverpool. Um, I, if the take home message is uh, advisors advise, but it's really the ministers that make the decisions. The scientists are working very hard. We've got a great system in the UK, thanks to having a, a standard national health system that's available to all at the point of entry. And part of that national health system involves research for all. And by having that unified approach, a national approach to research, we can do some of the best research in the world. And we're doing some of that out of Liverpool. So thank you very much. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Callum. Uh, it looks like it's over to me. Uh, I don't think Callum got the brief about doing the handover passage. But anyway, I'll introduce myself. Uh, you've heard who I am. I'm uh, Tom Solomon. I'm a, um, I'm a clinician working at a couple of hospitals in uh, Liverpool and then also I am the director of this thing called the Health Protection Research Unit in Emerging Infections and Callum's given a great flavour actually of, of the kind of environment in which we work. Um, 
the Health Protection Research Unit was involved in uh, Ebola and, and Zika, and I actually sat on the um, SAGE for Zika, but luckily it didn't attract the kind of attention and scrutiny uh, that the current one uh, is, is attracting. So I, I guess because of my role directing this thing called the Emerging Infections Unit, we always we have a team who tend to keep an eye on possible problems uh, overseas. And so the first I knew about this infection in China was December 31st when I saw a tweet um, from a colleague in China, which was slightly concerning, but I think at that time they thought it was, it was SARS, which of course caused an outbreak similar to this many years ago. Um, so, and actually then it was Callum who contacted me. I don't know if you remember Callum in January, I was in Africa doing some work there and Callum contacted me saying, you know, there's a concern about this outbreak in China and uh, sh should we activate this uh, protocol, this Isaric protocol, the clinical characterization protocol, which is like a, a sleeping giant. And so we uh, agreed to do that and put some health protection research unit resource into doing that. And I, I think I must say, Callum, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I think it was a uh, great foresight of yours because um, clearly that was critical to getting everything ready in Liverpool and nationally for this fantastic study that you've led. So um, we've heard about this Isaric uh, study. There's lots of other work going on in Liverpool around uh, diagnostic studies, developing diagnostics, work at the University and the School of Tropical Medicine. There's lots of immunology projects. One of our colleagues, Lance Turtle, is leading some of that work. And there's a community project that's just getting started being led by Neil French and um, a really interesting social science project being led by Sally Shield, Sheard, which um, it's, this is really interesting. It looks at uh, how the NHS workers are responding to, to what's happening. And then also we have discussions with policymakers at, at various levels, quite high levels as well, trying to understand how they're making decisions and why. So I think there's gonna be some really interesting data coming out of that. Um, my own work, I'm a neurologist, so I'm especially interested in, in the brain. And it became clear after the first few weeks uh, of, of this outbreak that although respiratory problems are the most important problems, there are also important brain problems. And one of my colleagues, Ben Michael, has been leading a study nationally on that, trying to understand the neuro and psychiatric problems. And, and the first preliminary publication from that was in the Lancet Psychiatry. And then we've also just published in Lancet Neurology a larger review of all these neurological problems. And we're currently working um, globally through our Brain Infections Global NHR program grant to join up various uh, projects looking at neurological problems associated with COVID-19. Um, I'm not sitting on the stage for this uh, outbreak. I do sit on the advisory committee for dangerous pathogens, which looks at all dangerous pathogens and feeds information into the government. But actually the, the, the most fun committee I've sat on uh, and chaired some of the panels is, is the MRC and NIHR funding panels. And we uh, in February started looking at this proposal for a treatment trial um, led by Peter Horby in Oxford. And we were pleased to support that. And it's fantastic that we have had the results of uh, one aspect of this trial, which have come out just yesterday. And this, we can talk about this more in the discussion if people want to, uh, but this is uh, this has shown, it, it, it's a real deal breaker. I mean, usually you hear people talking about a breakthrough on the television or the radio. And, uh, you know, the interview always ends with the, the, the person from the BBC saying, right, so when's the treatment gonna start? And the comment is always, oh, well, we have to do five years of studies because the breakthrough was in a mouse or the breakthrough was in the lab. But this breakthrough was actually with patients and with a drug which is available in every hospital. Uh, and the result is fantastic, a 30% um, reduction in mortality for patients who are on intensive care. And the drug is now being used today in our hospitals here in Liverpool. So it's a real breakthrough and um, it, it's great to have been a part of the team funding that study. Uh, Peter presented some of the results to our committee yesterday. And uh, so um, we could talk about that a little bit more if people want to. Um, and then the other thing, as, as, as Janet mentioned, is um, both Callum and I have done quite a lot of media work. I was on BBC Breakfast this morning. Um, I, I've been on more or less every other week. Uh, and it's been quite interesting and quite fun doing that. Um, I was on Question Time with Matt Hancock, actually, uh, early March. And at that stage, I think the feeling was not to give uh, the uh, politicians too much of a hard time. At, at that stage, everyone was still uh, presenting a united front, but clearly things have moved on since then. Anyway, that's my five minutes. I'll stop there, but there's clearly uh, lots of things for people to think about and, and discuss. Yeah. Thank you. Tom, uh, Callum, Louise, thank you very much indeed. Um, so the questions have been coming in. 
and um, I'm, I'm probably just going to do two or three at a time. Um, and the first one um, is about um, the evidence behind, as you can imagine, you can see this one coming, face coverings. So the, the arguments for and against, and a kind of associated question. I've got a very specific question from a, a Liverpool music graduate. Um, what's the research about um, singing in choirs? Well, I'm very happy to pick these two up. So face masks. Face masks protect individuals only if they're worn as part of uh, covering for the eyes, fully on the nose, mouth, and usually with gloves, and are used in a hospital environment. That's protecting the user. What we've discovered is that face coverings, such as masks or uh, a hoodie or a, a buff, or a scarf that's wrapped around the face, that protects people from spreading it. So it's very, very different from the medical surgical masks that we use in hospitals. We're talking about just slowing down the coughs and sneezes and bringing it down. So the reason it's been recommended is really to stop people in the asymptomatic and early phase of disease jumping on a bus or the underground and spreading their virus amongst the community. Now, it's not the highest of science. It's not, um, it's, it's not going to cure the disease. It's not going to stop it entirely. But it's probably giving a marginal improvement. And where social distancing isn't possible, it's the best that can be done. So that's why there's been this introduction of face coverings. But the, the nuance is the concept of covering rather than a face mask, per se. Singing in choirs and playing the bagpipes, which I do, and trombones and uh, other wood, woodwind instruments. Well, it turns out that singing and shouting and roaring on a football stadium um, generates more tiny droplets from the mouth and that these are infectious within a, a one to two meter area. So sadly, we've actually got evidence of three large outbreaks that have occurred in community choirs. And consequently, communal singing in a group is a bad idea, but actually so is standing on the um, football stadium screaming and shouting for your team, because that will then infect people standing around you. The concern around woodwind instruments is similar. There's a concern that that might be a risk. Uh, it may just be that people don't like the bagpipes. Um, unless Tom, Louise, anything to add on either of those, let's go on to um, uh, another question. Um, so we've we've been asked about how um, work is coordinated with with international colleagues, um, and you know how. So I suppose how we're working across the the world collaboratively at the moment, um, and um, also about precautions that we might be taking in order to assure the safety of the return of overseas students. And Louise, you might wanna have a go at, at that one. Um, also a question on long-term effects and, and kind of rehabilitation programs. So um, Tom, do you want to come in on any of those? Yeah, should, I, yeah. should I start with uh, international work? So um, particularly maybe international research. So um, I think one of the really uh, encouraging things about this outbreak, you know, it, it's been a terrible thing in so many ways, but there also have been some positive things that have come out of it. Um, and one of these is the way that the international research community has pulled together. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's, it, with science, traditionally, there's always been a bit of rivalry. People compete, people want to be the first or the biggest or the best. Um, but I think with the 20, th um, with the previous SARS, SARS outbreak, the 2013 outbreak, uh, there was a lot of criticism there that, that China was very slow to share information, slow to share their data, uh, and, and that contributed to, to, to the problem. So with this outbreak, as soon as they had the sequence of the virus, the genetic sequence, they shared that information. And that meant that all around the world, people could look at that genetic sequence and make their own diagnostic tests. So for example, in, in the UK, Public Health England, who we work with very closely, developed a, a diagnostic test uh, for, 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 for diagnosing the condition. So international collaboration has been, has been one of the positives about this. We, it, we, uh, my own group, we, we run this thing called Brain Infections Global, which is an international consortium of, of researchers working on brain infections. And we've, throughout the pandemic, I guess the, 
although we all hate Zoom and could, could well live without it, one of the benefits of it is that you can communicate much more easily. When I started my research career, the way you communicated with overseas people was sending a, something called a telex, uh, and then it became a fax and then email, but it's so much easier now. So we are able to do a lot of international research just through these kind of Zoom forums, et cetera, usually where we've already established the links. Louise. So just on the very specific point about what we're doing to reassure all staff and students, uh, not just our international student community, um, about a safe return to campus. Um, we, I'd like to reassure everyone we are doing our utmost to make our, our campus as COVID secure as is, as, as is physically possible. Uh, we are mindful that COVID is a notifiable diseases, a disease in the UK and that there are Public Health England guidelines and we need to be um, certain that we're acting within those guidelines. But we, we are also working um, locally, regionally across the Cheshire and um, Merseyside region to expand our uh, testing capacity, uh, to support test uh, track, track and contact uh, for our national, for our, our local community in the national context, and that will include um, an offer on TTC to our campus and actually also our sister campuses in our neighbouring universities. That work is ongoing, uh, and as soon as we have uh, definitive announcements, we'll be making them. But I'm, I'm confident that what we're doing is ahead of the curve in terms of what else is happening in the sector. And I'm really grateful to colleagues like Callum and Tom, whose uh, contributions to this have been uh, incredibly helpful. Louise, can we just stay with you? Um, because we've got a very specific question about the um, Atletico match and whether that led to a, an increase in infections. And I know you've been thinking very hard about this. Also, um, reduction of the two meter rule, what the scientific view is, and Callum might wanna come back in for that and indeed how politicians assess evidence. So Louise, to you. So uh, um, I should start by saying I'm a modeler, I'm not a disease outbreak modeler, uh, but many of our colleagues that uh, we work closely with are, and this has been looked at by various groups and most of the models, most of the groups have shown an uptick in hospital admissions with COVID in a timeline that would be comparable uh, with the, or would be linked with the Atletico match. It's also possible to actually look at the genotype of, of the virus, which, which changes, which mutates um, over the course of the pandemic. And there is certainly a genetic signal that suggests that some of the uptick in uh, local cases um, was linked to um, passage of the virus from uh, people in, in Spain traveling to Liverpool. The question of whether the actual match is responsible is actually much more difficult. So if you think about the situation that Callum just described, standing on, on the stands at, at Anfield and whether you actually get transmission of the virus in that context, or whether it's more to have happened actually on public transport from the match and in the bars and clubs of Liverpool the day before and the day after the match, that's really difficult. And I don't think we're, we're actually able to unpack that yet. But I think it's important we do because obviously, uh, a return to, to football and a return to something resembling our former normality would be very welcome. And if we can do that in a safe way, understanding you know, the eff effect effective ways of actually um, protecting uh, uh, people while they're at a, a, a mass event like a football match, it would be really helpful. So there is a piece of work ongoing that colleagues are leading on at the moment to see if we can actually unpack that a bit further. Thank you, Louise. Callum, if you come back in on those two other questions, and if I can throw a googly at you, we've also had a question in um, about um, whether the virus was developed in a lab. Okay, so I'll, I'll take the first. The, the virus being developed in the laboratory certainly was not. We can read the virus's code, that's the instruction set that's inside a virus, and we can look at how it compares to all the other known related coronaviruses. And there's nothing to suggest that anything other than natural evolution and jumping from an animal virus has happened. There's certainly no barcode in the middle that says made in China or made in America. Uh, there's no segments where there is signal where you would have a molecular splicing region that would, be, that would have to be there if this virus had been built in a laboratory. Um, so there's no evidence for that at all, I'd like to reassure you, it's, it's not a germ warfare agent, absolutely not. 
coming back to the one and the two meters, um, the, the reality is that the closer you are to someone that's infectious and the longer you spend with that person, the greater the risk. And for a fixed unit of time, the difference between two meters and one meter has a tenfold increased risk of transmission. So the science advice in the UK is that two meters is better than one meter. And if we can achieve that, that's what we should do. And if people cannot achieve that in close conditions, then they should wear a face covering. But it's a very nuanced story because in fact, being face to face with someone at one meter is different to being back to back to someone at one meter. And so it's very much context specific. It's also affected by sunlight, by the air changes in a room or whether you're outside on a breezy day. So uh, very, very, it's very, very nuanced. Uh, the science advice has been two meters at the moment because we've still got around about one and a half to 2000 cases a day still occurring. We've still got around about 200 deaths a day occurring. We've still got new hospital admissions occurring. So we're, we're actually at a later stage of this outbreak than many other countries in Europe so in the other countries in Europe that can go down to one meter can take a risk-based approach because they've got fewer cases in their community. But Britain, particularly the North and the Midlands, they've still got a fair number of cases. So personally, I'm one for sticking to the two meter rule. Thank you. Um, that's great. Thank you very much, Callum. Tom, um, we've been asked a question about why some people are asymptomatic and also um, why we don't really understand yet about immunity post-infection. Thanks, those are two great questions. Um, I think what people need to understand is with almost every infection, there's always a proportion of people who have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. And uh, that's what makes this disease different to some of the other very nasty diseases like Ebola, for example, or the SARS from 2013 or MERS, which is a related virus with those, viruses there tend to be more people that there are very more people have symptoms and so they're actually easier therefore to track and to trace and to close down and that's why we were able to bring those infections under control more easily but this is it's a coronavirus you have to remember that uh, of the seven coronaviruses which affect humans four of them just called mild seasonal disease the coughs and colds that we experience every year so uh, you know over time this coronavirus may well eventually settle into that kind of pattern and, but it's just because we are seeing it, it's completely new to us, we're seeing it for the first time. Everybody is at risk of infection, nobody has any pre-existing immunity. Most infections are, cause no symptoms, a small number cause hospital admission, and a smaller proportion cause death. But it's just the, the overall, it's a, it's a pyramid, we always talk about a, a pyramid like that, but, but the pyramid is so big, that's why we're seeing so many severe cases and deaths. Um, in terms of immunity, Again, different diseases behave in different ways. Uh, coronaviruses tend to, when people are infected, they develop an immunity that will protect them from that virus for the rest of that season and maybe for a few years afterwards. But then that immunity wanes, it drops over time and people are then susceptible. We don't know for this completely new coronavirus, we don't know what the pattern is going to be. I think it'd be surprising if people have had severe disease for them then to be vulnerable to getting severe disease again later that season or later in the year. Usually, if you've managed to fight off an infection, you then have protection for, for some while. But the, the thing we're not certain about is how long that while will be. But I think also it's worth remembering that if you have fought off the infection once, or you've had very mild disease once, or even asymptomatic infection, your immune system is then charged, ready to go. So that even if this virus continues to circulate, if you meet it again in a year or two years time, the fact you've already fought it off once means you're, you're less likely to have severe disease. Tom, does all that have a bearing on whether there will be a vaccine that's, that's efficacious enough? It, it, it does very much so. So some of the, most of my career I've spent studying viruses called flaviviruses, which are mosquito-borne viruses, things like dengue and Japanese encephalitis. And those viruses just infect you once, and you're then immune to them forever. And so for Japanese encephalitis virus, it's been relatively simple to create vaccines and, and to have them rolled out effectively. The, the problem developing vaccines against coronaviruses is because 
the viruses, the natural immunity wanes and the viruses change. We don't know. The vaccines will probably give protection. You know, the, the viruses, the vaccines which are being developed, hopefully will come through later this year, early next year, and will probably give protection, good enough protection to say we need to use these now. Whether they give lifelong protection is unknown. It may well be they don't and people will have to have boosters. Be more like a flu jab. Yeah, it may well. We may well end up in a situation like that because that's the, the situation with flu. Callum's spent a lot of years studying flu. And I don't know if you have a comment, Callum, on, on, on you know, the, the parallels with, with flu where we do have to vaccinate every... Yeah. While we move to you, Callum, can I also add in for you a question um, that somebody's asked about why the death rate in England is so high? Okay, so uh, dealing with the first one, the death rate actually in England isn't any different to elsewhere. We have um, a much higher bar into the hospitals. So we don't admit people to hospital unless they really, really need it. So we have an apparent high case fatality rate in hospital, but the overall case fatality rate is not actually higher than other countries. That, that, that has to be stated. But there's nothing special about UK that it's, it's not killing more people disproportionately as a rate of the number of our population. We just have a lot of people in a small amount of space. We're, we're a very busy country. Uh, it could be you, worse, we could be Belgium, right? <laughs> Well, the 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 the, de the rate of de the rate is normalised against the population, and our death rate isn't that that isn't that bad. If you want to see bad places like America or South South America, and we really haven't seen the, the virus yet in India and Africa yet, and I think there's going to be a global a global tragedy in these countries. The, the, the question about vaccinating, vaccination is fascinating. There's some viruses we catch in childhood and it's better to catch them in childhood than to catch them in later life. And chickenpox is a really good example. If you catch chickenpox when you're three or four years old, you have an un unpleasant couple of days, you get some spots, you might have one or two scars. On the whole, you'll never catch it again and you might get shingles in later life. But on the whole, that's not gonna kill you. It's unpleasant, but it won't kill you. If you catch chicken pox in your 20s or 30s, you can have a very severe disease and your brain can be affected and your lungs can be affected. So coronavirus um, could be one of these ones that we actually want to catch in childhood, like the other, there's five other coronaviruses that we, you, you want to catch in childhood. And then when you get exposed to it as you grow up in future years, you get a little natural boost and that protects you. And then only when you're a frail elderly person and your immune system is starting to to slow down, does it become a problem? Now, it's really complicated this, because if you go for a vaccinate everybody approach, unless your vaccine is absolutely perfect, it may be that you actually disadvantage some of the younger children. And we've started to see that with some of the other vaccines that came out in the last 20 years, that some diseases it's good to catch in childhood and deal with it properly. Other diseases it's important to vaccine to vaccinate at the correct time, particularly vaccination and pregnancy has turned out to be a really important way of protecting babies that can't be vaccinated from some serious illnesses. So this is, this is where the research comes in and where you, we really need to do very careful studies, um, understanding our population, understanding perhaps we need to vaccinate different ethnic groups at different ages. That might be the nuance that we need in order to protect people, particularly from the South Asian group who form a disproportionate number of people that make a huge contribution to healthcare um, and public services. Um, these people have done really badly with COVID. They have far more public facing, personal interacting roles. So they've been coughed in their faces much more than everybody else and consequently done very badly. So do we need to think about vaccinating certain public sector workers or certain ethnicities? It's gonna be really interesting how we do this going forward. Thank you very much, Callum. And I'm afraid, everyone, that um, we now have to draw the event to a close. There are some questions outstanding, but I think my colleagues in the events team can make sure that uh, our experts um, uh, can reply to, to those questions. Um, I've been struck this morning, as I've been struck throughout uh, the whole of lockdown, at how much pride our alumni, 
um, our staff, our students, the residents of our city region and beyond, uh, how proud they are of Louise and her colleagues in the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences, um, but also proud of the staff who make it possible for our scientists to do their work, the, the lab technicians, the people who clean the labs, who open the buildings, who make sure the buildings are secure and who generally look after us all on campus. So the effort, and I referred to it in the speech, the, the little speech that I made at the beginning, that's being made by everyone during this pandemic has been absolutely stellar. But you know, I do want to, to pay a special tribute to, to Tom and Callum for you know, the way in which they have embraced the, the challenges of the public communication of the science that has, is, is going to make a difference to all of us because you know, it is time consuming and it's exhausting and it's nerve wracking and you know, it is a constant drain but incredibly important and important in terms of everybody knowing what Liverpool has achieved. But, you know, I do also want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to my colleague, Louise Kenny, whose leadership across the city region in bringing together all the, the, the health organizations and linking them with our research effort has been absolutely game changing. So I'm so proud to be the VC of this institution at this moment. Thank you everybody for, for tuning in this morning. Um, and don't forget that we've got um, another of these events in a couple of weeks time. And uh, I know we'll get a big audience because it is about something else that the city's really good at and that's football. So um, Kieran Maguire, um, who enlivens my Google alerts every day will be, will be there to, to talk. So thank you everybody and um, stay safe. Thanks, bye.